All right, this is episode number 14 of Into the Absurd with Dr. Mark Nielsen. He's the Associate Dean of the College of Science and a Professor of Mathematics at the University of Idaho. Um, so Mark, um, this paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences by Eugene Wigner. It was on your website, it's very interesting. And there was this quote, and it read, uh, Mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty, cold and austere, like that of a sculpture, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, yet sublimely pure and capable of a stern perfection, such as only the greatest art can show. The true spirit of delight, the exaltation, the sense of being more than man, which is the touchstone of the highest excellence, is to be found in mathematics as surely as in poetry. This is a quote from Bertrand Russell in the study of mathematics. Do you agree? <laughs> um, oh, you know, I, I, most mathematicians are comfortable uh, wearing multiple hats when it comes to the philosophy of the subject that we study. Uh, for, for example, uh, well, that, that issue is, is one. Um, in many ways, yeah, we, we uh, are comfortable with a statement like that. Uh, most of us are drawn to mathematics because of its beauty. Uh, we, the, the beauty that we see in it. Uh, we also recognize that it is extremely useful in the modeling of the world around us, in, in uh, science, it's in many ways the foundations of science. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, we know enough about our discipline to know that not everything about it can represent things in the real world. Uh, there's, there's stuff in mathematics that bears no resemblance at all to the physical reality that we live in. And so, uh, yeah, mathematics reflects reality. It is not reality. And we, we work in two different modes there. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a it's a symbolic representation of reality to the best of our abilities that we can produce yeah i, I would say it gives tools that allow us to um, explain and model the natural world and it's a debate on is is the natural world mathematical fundamentally that's a that's a debate i don't know if i have a hardcore opinion on that one but uh, mathematics itself encompasses much more than that. There's, there's, a, oh, there's an author, um, uh, Ian Stewart is his name. He, uh, he's a mathematician, but he's also just a, a fantastic author. Uh, he wrote a book. Um, it's uh, a follow-up, actually, of uh, the classic book Flatland from uh, oh, the late 1800s, written by Edwin Abbott. Uh, Flatland was kind of a proto-science fiction book. It's about a, a two-dimensional world. And uh, in, in that book, or uh, Ian Stewart, rather, wrote a uh, sequel. There's, there's been many sequels to Flatland produced. I, I think Stewart's is probably the best. It's called Flatterland. And uh, in Flatterland, he gives... Uh, a description of what he calls the mathiverse, which is bigger than the universe. The mathiverse. The mathiverse. mathiverse, yes. And, okay, it's a, it's a silly fiction book, but this one page description of the mathiverse is the best single description I've ever seen of the universe that mathematicians work in. And uh, we, we don't mm. limit it to physical reality. Uh, the mathiverse contains absolutely anything that logic can create, whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that word real is, is inadvisable because uh, reality depends what kind of reality you're talking about. To a mathematician, the mathiverse is a real place. I always think of it as when I'm doing, when I'm thinking about a math problem, I'm not thinking about abstractions. I'm, I'm working with things that are 
that are actually, you know, that have an existence. There's this Platonism. This is uh, that ideas have a, an existence of their own. And so uh, I think of my research thinking as a field trip. I'm visiting the mathiverse. I'm, I'm thinking about hmm. objects that exist there and trying to discover their properties. Uh, much the same as a, a geologist who is, uh, you know, studying the uplift of the Andes Mountains might might go to the Andes to uh, do their uh, their field research. Well, we go to the Mathiverse for that. Yeah. What are you researching right now? Uh, well, my my research is in. I'm a discrete geometer. Um, my uh, original my dissertation was in convexity theory, which is study of properties of convex sets. But uh, specifically, I was trying to do questions about tiling space with convex sets. Um, and space being, you know, tilings of the plane are uh, well studied. Uh, study or tilings of higher dimensional spaces, less so. And I was actually doing tilings in infinite dimensional spaces. So it was kind of, kind of a really esoteric topic. Since then, I've kind of wandered back to the plane. Um, most of my uh, my research problems that I think about are just in the two-dimensional plane and properties of point sets uh, within there. So one of the one of the questions that I would really, before I retire, I would love to solve this problem. Um, it take me a few minutes, I guess, to explain it, but uh, it it is easily explained. It's not. Uh, I don't. There are some fields in math where the problems are so complicated it would take, uh, you know, a two semester course to understand the problem that's being worked on. My, mine are not that way. Uh, so uh, imagine that you can uh, color each point of the plane uh, by one of two different colors. You can paint it either blue or red. And mm -hmm. This, this coloring doesn't have to be in any way that you could actually, you know, paint with a brush. You could, the points can, the blue and the red points can be horribly mixed up. But each point of the plane receives one of those two colors, blue or red. That's called a two coloring. And uh, now suppose you've got a triangle that is your favorite triangle in the world. You want to lay that triangle down on the plane so that all three corners have the same color. Um, if your triangle can do that, if you can do that with your triangle, no matter what the coloring is, uh, somebody else colors the plane, the, the devil colors the plane, and your challenge is to put the triangle down with all three vertices on the same color. If you can always do that, no matter how the devil has colored the plane, then that triangle is said to be a two Ramsey triangle. This Euclidean Ramsey theory is the name of this general area of, of uh, geometry. And so uh, the, there's a conjecture that goes way back to the early 1970s. And it was a conjecture made by just a, a uh, who's who of mathematics at that time. Hmm. I mean, Paul Erdős, uh, Ron Graham, these are just giants in the field. And, and they, they wrote this paper together. I can't actually remember who all is on it, but there's like 13 different authors and many of them are, are uh, giants. And they conjectured that all triangles are, have that property except equilateral triangles. That the, and it, it's known that the equilateral triangle doesn't. There's a way to color the plane so that you, whatever, you know, if you've got an tr equilateral triangle of one inch on each side, then I can color the plane in a way that you cannot put that triangle down with all three vertices the same color. So we know that the equilateral triangle doesn't. The conjecture is that all other triangles do have that property. And that, that conjecture, as simple as it sounds, has stood for now close to 50 years. And nobody solved it. Well, I think I know how to solve it. And I you know I've I've had this idea for something like 10 or 15 years, and it's always the details that, that get you hung up. That and the fact that my associate dean stuff means I don't get to think about this as often as I'd like to. Uh, but I think the answer is actually 
most triangles don't have that property. Uh, I, I think that uh, the triangles that do are kind of a rare exception. Uh, and I have a method that I think will show that if I can push the details through. Now, that alone shows how weird this is. We don't know enough about this problem to distinguish between a conjecture that says everything has the property and my guess that almost everything doesn't have that property. So this is, I guess you've got a, a wide gap of ignorance here. Anyway, now that, that problem I guess it wouldn't. That, oh, go ahead. Well, it wouldn't really make sense to me for it to work for most triangles, right? Well, um, there's, uh, there's known families of triangles that do work. Um, for example, all right triangles have this property. We, we, somebody has proved that. That was proved, I think, in the 90s. I can't remember for sure. Um, and properties, there, there's algebraic properties involving the lengths of the sides of the triangle, that if they're satisfied, then that triangle has that property. So there's, uh, there's lots of triangles that we know do, but none of that would defeat or disprove what I think happens. Uh, I think what happens is that I can associate to each triangle that has that property a polynomial. And then I can use the nice countability properties of polynomials or the roots of polynomials to, uh, to show that uh, actually the, the triangles that have that property are, are, are sparse that they're kind of exceptions in the same way that most, you know, the real numbers, most real numbers are irrational. There's, there's only a few real, or, you know, the, 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 the rational numbers, the fractions, the fractions of integers are, are sparse in the real numbers. Most real numbers are, are not. Uh, in the same way, I think most triangles aren't uh, in that family. Now, that problem has no bearing on any real application. There's no usefulness, at least known, uh, for a problem like that. Why am I interested in it? Well, because it's an interesting problem and I find proofs about it to be beautiful. So, but, you know, the, the fact that uh, we can investigate a question like that with the same tools that we use to, uh, for example, study the course of an epidemic like this, uh, this current one we're all living through. That's remarkable. Uh, mathematics plays both roles. Mathematics helps us understand the actual world we live in, but it also explores a, a universe beyond what we live in. Yeah, this this mathiverse. It, uh... Yeah. Because what you're doing really is exploring more realms of the mathiverse, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, that uh, the questions that I find most interesting now they're, you know, I'm, I'm a pure mathematician. I'm a geometer. So I'm not, I'm not really interested in applications of mathematics. Uh, I'm glad that they have, it. I'm glad that they exist. Uh, I, I put it this way. The fact that mathematics has applications means that I have a job uh, because engineers need to learn mathematics because they do very useful things and mathematics is necessary to do them. So universities need to employ mathematicians such as myself to teach people to do useful things with mathematics. But the useful things are not why I study it. There are mathematicians who do. They're even within our department. Uh, our department has a, a share of both pure mathematicians like me and mathematicians who are applied mathematicians and study mathematics specifically for its, its applications. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for somebody like me, uh, the applications are great. I, I, I even I love teaching those. One of my favorite classes to teach is differential equations because I think it's so cool 
that so much of of uh, physical reality can be modeled by something as simple as a differential equation. But my own research, what I think about, no, it's it's not applied at all. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, and um, I think for me, I I definitely enjoy learning about the abstract nature of math rather than how it's applied to the real world. Um, especially in my, cause I'm in this, uh, partial differential equations class uh -huh. and it's, it's very interesting, you know, how it's all applied to the physical world, but I'm more interested in how the math actually works. Okay. Well, and you know, I didn't actually discover that until, oh, really, I guess, um, the kind of, I, I was an odd case. I graduated, uh, and stayed on an extra year working toward a master's degree before going mm -hmm. away to graduate school. And it was during that inter intermediate year, um, when I, I had done my undergraduate work, but I wasn't yet a PhD student. I, I moved away, uh, after that summer to, to start my work. Uh, at University of Washington. And it was during that year that I figured out that what I really liked was the abstraction. That, uh, that because, you know, I, I didn't, I don't think I understood until then that, that that was what pure mathematics was about. That pure mathematics was more an art than a science. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, an art and a science because you're you're almost because you're not really conducting experiments. You're more so working things out and kind of discovering things as you go along, right? Right. Uh, in fact, this is a conversation that I like to have with my students. I, I teach a course for the honors program. Um, in fact, I believe the, the paper that you quoted from when we started is on a link for that course. Uh, one of the themes when I teach that course, I alternate themes. and One of the themes I use is um, the applicability of mathematics to modeling um, the world. So, uh, yeah, I, I, an, an applied mathematician like within our department, uh, Dr. Chris Ramin is is a young guy who's uh, a fantastic mathematical biologist, uh, very good at, at uh, modeling using sophisticated mathematics applied to modeling biological systems, um, is what he is doing a science. It's certainly closer than what I do. And, and Actually, I think you'd make the case that he probably is because he is, see, science to me is the scientific method. It's you, you make a conjecture, you do tests to, to uh, see if that conjecture holds up to your data. And if it doesn't, you make adjustments and then you run more experiments to test it. You, you do this continuous refinement. Uh, and, and I guess an applied mathematician like that, they, they are doing that because they're, you know, they're, they're, their guess, their hypothesis is a model, a mathematical model. Maybe it's a, an equation or a, a dynamical system of some kind or you know, cellular automata, whatever it is. There's lots of different ways you can model things. But they have a model and that's a high, that's the hypothesis is this model will will help to explain this, the phenomenon I'm studying. Well, they can, they can run tests and then refine the model. And so you, you can pattern that on the scientific method and say that is a science. What I do, I don't, I don't run experiments. I, I either prove something or I don't. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no refinement. I, I guess I run an experiment in that I, I have an idea on how a proof might work and I try it out, and if it doesn't work, then I have to modify my method. Maybe that's something. But ultimately, I either prove it or I don't. There's there's no approximation in mathematics, in, in pure mathematics. Um, I guess in, in that sense, you're almost an investigator. 
like uh, oh, a uh, detective. Yeah, detective. Yeah, right. That's actually one I hadn't thought of, but that that's a good comparison. Because uh, because they either did the crime or they didn't, and, and then you have to find out how they did it. And you either prove it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, that's in some ways that's uh, you know that well I don't know my my applied mathematician friends would not agree that that makes uh, that that makes it harder. Because there's there's certainly plenty of hard work in in refining the approximations, um, mm-hmm. but it, it's a it's a fundamental difference. Uh, when when I'm done, I have a theorem that is rock solid true. It's it's not an approximation anymore. Uh, now it's not modeling a real world. You know the, there is no ultimate theorem possible if what you're trying to do is explain how some biological process works um that that's always going to be a uh, a conjecture that's subject to refinement um, yeah well that's also because there's uh, there's a finite amount of data right yeah, sure and it's a, just a fundamental difference between the universe and the mathiverse yeah <laughs> things in the mathiverse can be proved things in the universe eh, it's a little fuzzier and maybe that's a, a case argument for uh, against the quote that you opened with um, that uh, mathematics mathematics is more black and white than the universe so is it a perfect reflection of the universe no is it a, is it a pretty good one yes uh, it, it can help explain the universe, but uh, uh, it, it perfectly explains the mathiverse. It only approximates the physical universe. Yeah, and I guess uh, I think, at least under my impression, if we had every single bit of data, if we knew everything about the universe, I feel like we could use math- mathematics to perfectly model it. But uh, even then, I don't think that we'll ever be able to have all the data in the universe (laughs) yeah yeah well and and, you know fundamentally um is the universe subject to perfect mathematical analysis or is it ultimately kind of random Um, yeah uh that's that's actually a really interesting philosophy question that I don't necessarily have uh, any insight on. I, I think it's really interesting to think about, but it's possible. Uh, I mean, we, we know now because of uh, that there are uh, systems that we can create that have very simple rules. Uh, like this, this is stuff that comes out of, uh, oh, like Conway's Game of Life is a, famous example the rule i don't know if you've seen that but it's it's a cellular automata game you 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 have a grid of squares that can be either live cells or uh, dead cells and there are rules for how you go from one generation of live cells to the next generation and if you just google conway's game of life you'll you'll come up with things that you can play with this on and it's fascinating because you can create with very simple rules, you can create things that apparently have just random behavior. Hmm. So we know that that's possible, that simple rules do not necessarily mean simple behavior. And now the universe is very complicated behavior. Does that mean there are no rules? Well, not necessarily. It could be very simple rules that we just can't see. Yeah. Because, well... I kind of think of this example of uh, if you wave your hand in front of a slug, it it won't even notice you, right? Yeah. And I think our our intelligence and our intellect could uh, potentially be limited to the sense that we that there's certain things happening in the universe that we just can't even see that uh, that we can't even observe, and if we can't observe it, then we can't measure it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, that, that's correct. In fact, I think I, I am not a physicist. I have 
just enough. I know just enough about physics to be dangerous, as they say. That's, <laughs> that's kind of my take on what string theory is. That string theory says much of the... Uh, it's, string theory is, as I understand it, an untestable hypothesis because it's very... Uh, uh, essence, the, the nature of what it says is that uh, reality, so, some parts of the makeup of reality are too fine for our observation. Because hmm. uh, it, yeah, it essentially says that reality is multidimensional, but that some of those dimensions are wound so tightly that they are too fine for us to actually detect. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it, it could be that re reality does have simple rules that we'll never see them. And, and not just because they're complicated, but because they are of a nature where they are not seeable. Yeah, and uh, I think perhaps maybe we could develop technology that could see what we can't see, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. There, there were getting beyond um, my physical knowledge. I'd have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think we're getting beyond the knowledge of anyone. Yeah, this is where one of my friends in the physics department, uh, we have discussions quite often about uh, the interplay between math and physics. And uh, she likes to say that... Uh, uh, that physics is just mathematics with the constraint of reality. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that statement, that in, in any <laughs> case, uh, yeah, physicists have a, a, a different thought process that, in my view, they, they think things differently than mathematics, mathematicians do. Do you think more so that physics is, uh, is more so constrained by mathematics. Well, it's limited by, you know, cer certainly um, the limitations of mathematics impose limitations on physics because it's a fundamental tool for physicists. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but that, that actually is getting back to that question of the, the relation between mathematics and reality. Uh, in my friend's view, then, uh, physics is just the part of mathematics that does actually deal with the real universe. Maybe that's correct, uh, but mathematics, as I you know, I've said, I, it involves much more than that. And uh, to a pure mathematician, the part that deals with the real universe isn't even the interesting part. Uh, what is the interesting oh it's just the yeah it's uh, for me it's you know it's whatever discrete geometry problem has caught my attention whatever corner of the map yeah. i'm thinking about that <laughs> so is um so this all uh, uh, there's this uh, other thing on that um I was reading it off of this exam from the the fourth dimension oh, uh -huh. course, right? It's uh, it's what is Godel's theorem? Yep. And how it how the paradox within that theorem affects at least the way that we think in the world, right? And how that makes you feel as far as. Um, I mean, why can't we understand everything in math? Right. And that, let me explain the background on that. Uh, Gödel's theorem is, to me, the most significant discovery in mathematics, probably in the 20th century. Uh, it's really philosophy. It's philosophy and mathematics. And it's, it's that interplay where you can't tell which one it is. But uh, I think Gödel hmm. probably would have considered himself a philosopher, uh, but it's a it's a philosophical result about math. So, 
mathematicians use not the scientific method, we use the axiomatic method. Uh, the axiomatic method, instead of being a hypothesis that you continually refine through gathering data, in the axiomatic method, you set out ahead of time things that you accept as true fundamentally without necessity of proof. Um, axioms are to be self-evident truths. And uh, it, you have to have those. You cannot, uh, anybody who's studied geometry in high school knows that to prove one theorem, you need to use a theorem before that. And to prove that one, you have to use something before that. And you get this infinite retrograde. At some point, it has to stop. And at some point, you have to say, no, I don't have to prove that. It's obvious. It's, it's, uh, th and, and those are your axioms. So axioms are the things that you're not going to argue about. They're, they're just true. And in the axiomatic method, you start with those. And the first theorem you prove, you can only use those. You can only use the things that you've regarded as obvious. But then once you've proved that theorem one, you now have theorem one in your pile of things known to be true. And so theorem two can be proved using any of your axioms. And uh, I, I just got an alert. Did you, uh, are you seeing that same? Yeah, thing? I got the alert too, but it said that it, it reconnected. Okay, great. So uh, once you've proved theorem one, you can, uh, you can use it to prove theorem two. And then theorem two is in your pile of true things. And you expand your pile of true things, but each time you do a proof of a new thing, you can only use the things that are already in your pile. That, that way you're avoiding a circular hmm. logic. You're avoiding, you know, proving theorem B using theorem A, but theorem A needed theorem B in its proof. And so you get this you know, circular logic. It, it, the axiomatic method avoids that. So that's the method that that mathematicians play with, the axiomatic method. Well, Gödel's theorem, which I think was in the 1930s, early 1930s, uh, Gödel proved that no axiom system can give a complete description of mathematical truth. That no matter what axioms you adopt, there's going to be theorems that are true but you can't prove them with those axioms. Huh. Uh, or that, that's a, that's a uh, almost cartoon level simplification of, of what he says. But, hmm. but, you know, that fundamentally it's that, that no, there is no finite description of truth. That mathematical truth can't be summed up in a finite set of axioms. Uh, hmm. And uh, so... To me, that's a really interesting fact because it says the mathiverse is an incredibly complicated place. There's no simple description for it. There's no finite description for it. Hmm. Um, and there's, uh, there's a couple directions that we could go on that. But uh, to me, the, uh, the most interesting implication is this. Um, I think that there's, uh, well, I have to back up a little bit. There's a, a class of theorems uh, of results in mathematics that I really like, uh, that they all have this general flavor. They all say most things in mathematics are very complicated. Um, for example, uh, anybody who's taken calculus has heard about continuous functions. Roughly, a continuous function is one that you can draw the graph without lifting your pencil from the paper. And yeah. differentiable functions are functions that have tangent lines. A, a, a function is differentiable if it has a tangent line at, at a point. It's differentiable at that point if it has a tangent line at that point. And if you think about it, if you try to draw functions, it seems like if you're not going to lift your pencil from the paper and you're going to draw the graph, most places it's going to be differentiable. 
That's, that's the experience mm-hmm. you get. And most functions that you study have that property. They're, they're differentiable mm-hmm. most places. You know, they might have a little cusp somewhere where there's not a tangent line at one point, but, but most places they have tangent lines. Well, there's a, a famous uh, fact in, in uh, real analysis that says, in fact, most continuous functions are not differentiable anywhere. Most continuous functions are so, their graphs are so complicated and crinkly that there are no tangent lines at any points. Huh. And uh, that, that, that takes some sophisticated math to prove that, it turns out. But anyway, there's a, there's a whole class of theorems like that, that say most things that we study in mathematics are really weird. Um, oh, and uh, uh, by the way, a curve that, if you think about a curve, how could a curve be so crinkly that it doesn't have any tangent lines anywhere? Well, that means it's like a fractal. It, it, fractals are things that people have heard of. And fractals have that kind of infinitely complicated behavior. Well, it turns out most continuous functions are fractal-like, which is bizarre. Uh, well, most, most things in mathematics have that kind of a result most whatever mathematical object you're studying there's probably it's probably true that most of those objects are really weird so now Gödel's theorem Gödel's theorem tells me that in the mathiverse most things well Gödel's theorem actually fundamentally only says that no matter what your axioms are, there's there's at least some things that can't be proved. I suspect, in fact, that no matter what your axioms are, most things can't be proved. That the uh, the the mathematical universe is actually so complicated that we not only have the existence of not provable things, but I I think we have the predominance of not provable things. And I think reality is probably that way. So I, I think most things in physical reality can't be explained, have no uh, no finite description. Uh, I don't have, you know, there's, there's probably a, not a way to prove that, but I just suspect it because of the way I know I see behavior in the mathiverse. Yeah, Um Looks like we lost connection to the server again. I don't know, yeah. but I think it still records even if you lose. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Um, yeah I certainly think that there are things that you can't prove, or at least there are things that we know to be true, even though you can't prove it to be true at least with the, the axioms given. Right. Okay. There, and, and see, there we're getting to a distinction between what we mean by truth mathematically and what most people mean when they use the word truth colloquially. Uh, and I, I would agree. Um, in fact, uh, Gödel's theorem is applicable only to mathematical the mathematical version of true having a having a mathematical proof but there's uh yeah the i i think it's a a pretty uh poor existence if we limit our notion of what is true to just the mathematical sense and i say that because i'm a religious individual i have things that i believe that can't be proved they're not even in that realm uh but i you know i have a bigger notion of truth than uh, than simply a mathematical proof. Yeah. And I think um, to that regard, even with uh, Gödel's theorem, you kind of have to have a certain degree of faith in how mathematics works, right? Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, in fact, one, <laughs> there's, okay, Gödel's, they, the people talk about Gödel's incompleteness theorems, and there are, in fact, two uh, fundamentally. One, one of them is the one that I already described that says no matter what axioms you have, it can't describe 
all mathematical truth, that there will be things that are true that can't be proved with those axioms. But the second one is even more striking. The second theorem of Gödel says um, that one of those things that can't be proved is, is this set of axioms even consistent, or is there a built-in contradiction within the system? So if you apply that to math, we, we do have axioms that we use in mathematics. There, for set theory, for example, we the currently accepted axioms are the Zermelo-Frankel axioms with choice. We add, take the Zermelo-Frankel axioms, which were developed a long time ago to explain set unions and intersections and all of that. And you have to add to it something we call the axiom of choice, which I won't try to explain right mm. now, but that's that that's our that's our axiom set and uh, then you can add to that uh, piano's axioms for how the real numbers behave and you know you can come up with things that we accept as axioms in mathematics and if you apply Gödel's theorems to those things here's the state of mathematics we know that those axioms are not enough to explain to answer all questions to to uh, if I ask, you know, is this true or false? Maybe there's a proof for it. Maybe there isn't. We know one such thing. If you've heard of the continuum hypothesis, we know the continuum hypothesis is not answerable with our current axioms. You, you can't either prove it or disprove it. But Gödel's second theorem also says, whoops, we're disconnected again. Don't want to get to the punchline. I just... think we can just... Okay, there we're connected. So one one of the one of the things that we know we can't prove is whether or not our axioms are contradictory. In other words, mathematics, yeah. for all we know, could be complete nonsense. It could be um, self contradictory. We know we'll never prove that it isn't. <laughs> But so now why, why do we keep doing mathematics? Well, because we fundamentally have faith that it is, that it's consistent and everything. Yeah. Okay. But that, that is, is, you have to go on faith. Yeah. Uh, it kind of reminds me, uh, cause we can, cause we can't see, we can't physically see a, a wave of light or at least what the wave looks like. Um, but we can see how it affects the world and we can use it. Yeah, and, and that's, well, there again, getting back to that opening quote. Uh, and I'm not a physicist, so I, I, I don't know, but, you know, I, I, waves to me seem like a mathematical model that explains behavior. But it's hard to say what it is in reality. Yeah. And uh, so that's that. What is the relation? Is is the re is reality in fact mathematical, or are waves something we can't really understand, and we just have this mathematical notion that happens to model it pretty well? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that that all kind of goes into uh, this concept of like is. Was is the universe mathematical in nature, or did we invent mathematics? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, that's that's the fundamental question of, uh, I guess, Platonism. To uh, and I, there again, mathematicians are adept at wearing both hats. Uh, the the opposite of Platonism is formalism, which formalism would be what you said that we invented it. Uh, formalism is that mathematics is a game, that you your axioms are simply you're inventing some game rules, and then the game is you see what you can prove with it, but you're just doing a game. Uh, Platonism is that, no, I'm not inventing it, I'm discovering it. It's there. I'm going to the mathiverse, and I'm observing what's going on there, and I'm, I'm making yeah. discoveries. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it, it, Mathematicians are comfortable thinking of it both ways. Most of the time, we're Platonists. Most of the time, I think we're we're thinking of discovery. Hmm. 
but invention is not out of the question <laughs> where we're yeah. capable of thinking of it that way. Well, I mean, that's kind of how, I mean, everything is. I mean, did we, because uh, when you say uh, Platonism, are you talking about kind of Plato's theory of the forms? Yeah. 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 It's, it's Plato's notion that things have existence ideas have an actual existence yeah like there's this uh there's this perfect realm almost where yeah. if you combine all the leaves together there's this one original leaf right right there is a right there's there's uh an essence of leafness right yeah <laughs> and I, actually he explained that and i is this in memo i can't remember uh one of the dialogues though sets it forth really well where and he uses mathematics as the the setting to explain it he he says that you know when when a mathematician is talking about uh, a circle he's not talking about the thing he's drawing on the paper or the you know parchment mm -hmm. or whatever it would have been but he's talking about the nature of a circle circleness yeah you know, what a circle actually yeah. <laughs> is and that's a great way to think of it because that that's true uh, a theorem in geometry is not a theorem about that thing on the paper the thing on the paper is just a picture to help your mind kind of visualize the uh, the actual yeah. things you're talking about yeah and i guess in, in that sense mathematics is really not only a tool to help us uh, understand the world, but also just kind of interact with it and see how we can kind of build our world to make it better. And then with that, kind of just go through the world knowing a little bit more about it. But at the same time, we still won't ever have all the details available to us. Yeah, I, I agree. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. All right. Well, thanks. It's it's always fun to talk about stuff like this. I, I uh, yeah, I love it. No, I really appreciate you coming on, and I learned a lot from that, and it definitely blew my mind at points. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Uh, can I ask what uh, what your plans are once you graduate? Yeah, my plans. Um, I'm hoping to get a data science job. Great. So maybe do that for a little bit. And then uh, if I get an opportunity to perhaps get a master's degree in data science, I'll take that so that I can get a better job, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's great that there are such good career opportunities um, in mathematical sciences. Yes, uh, and that that comes from again that fact that mathematics is so useful. Uh, you know, it's 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 useful. So there are people that that want to hire people that can do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it helps if you get to think about things that you uh, that you love to think about. It certainly does. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Yeah, no problem. And uh, for all you out there, uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, just email into dot the dot absurd dot podcast at gmail dot com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>